G'day, viewers and listeners. It's Ed Fox with The Edward Show. I should say g'day, y'all. I, I'm, I move from the deep south of Australia uh, to the northern, southern part of the United States. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm learning to say g'day, y'all. If I really want to confuse them, James, I say g'day, all y'all. I, I think I've got that right. Anyway, you'll be able to teach me about that. So I came across Not that James. I'm from Tennessee or anything. No, but, but you know, you know words. So uh, James... I was actually reading a book and it, uh, in the book was the word limb, L-I-M-N, which I had never read before. I'm well read. I love books, but I'm a ninth grade dropout. So high school dropout, but love reading. And so I'd never come across this word. And so I went on search in search of the word. And I came across James's uh, uh, writings on that word. And, you know, I thought it was going to be like a dry dictionary explanation or definition and i had a lot of fun reading that particular article and understanding what the word meant and so i reached out to james via his website and i said hey james how about coming on my show and i lo and behold i got a response and so here he is james harbeck and J did i did i say that right yeah harbeck or as they say in new zealand harbeck harbeck Yes, our bet. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not from do, New Zealand. It's just how I know somebody's from New Zealand because they say my name that way. Hobby. Right. Well, we te I test them. I tell people they say, "Are oh, you from New Zealand or Australia?" I said, "Here's how you find out if I'm from New Zealand or Australia. Say the word sex and fishing ships, and if you get six fishing chips, then you know that you're talking to a New Zealander. So they get oh, confused. I remember uh, being in Wellington, New Zealand, and somebody is. At a chip shop, says, Stephen orders a fish and chips for crust. There you go, exactly. So uh, I uh, I write on a piece of paper. People go, oh, I wish I could have the Australian accent, and I said, you can. All you say is good, I e y e might m i g h t. Good, I might, and there you go. You've learned how to speak Australian in three easy words. I do that at the outback all the time. I write it on a coaster, and I say that as a server, you can learn to say good day, mate really easy so well and if you're lucky if you're talking to an actual australian it might be the last three words you even need to say <laughs> well that's i'm one of the few australians that enjoys the outback steakhouse actually I, they are not a sponsor of the show but if they would like to be a sponsor of the show they're more than welcome to come on board so james where did your love of all things words come about how did that come about well i'm i'm sure that it, in part, it's that my uh, my dad as a linguist. Well, he was. He he he's still my dad. He's still walking and breathing the earth, but he's not he's not working as a linguist now. Um, but so I was in a house full of books about language. But another thing, and I hadn't really taken that much account of it at the time, but I didn't grow up. I, I grew up in. Canada. I did grow up. I, I grew up in Canada, but I didn't grow up in a city or a normal small town. My parents worked for one of the local First Nations, also known as Indians, a term that's fallen out of use in Canada. But so I grew up a lot of the time on a reserve where a lot of the people around me were speaking a language I didn't understand at all. I'm sorry to say I still don't speak it, which is kind of shameful. But on the other hand, my parents, I don't think, really encouraged me to learn it because then they had a way to talk to the, to each other without my understanding it or my brother. But I, I feel that that's part of it. And also, I think it's just, it's just the thing that's bred in the bone. Some people just naturally love words and languages. Um, hunting is a family tradition. My father, my brother, and I make bad jokes, and my mother laughs at them. Okay. I See, I knew. Now, I didn't know that about you, but I knew we could get along just after reading a few of your articles. Uh, I'm the same. So I have a dad joke channel on TikTok. Yeah. There's nothing, <laughs> you know, but we, we were the ones that dad would drive past the cemetery and say people are dying to get in there. Or it's the I used that there. line two days ago. There you go. Uh, with a friend, a, a kid. Oh, well, specifically, I was with my wife and we were up in the cemetery visiting some family graves and uh we noted that the chapel didn't seem to have any services going on that day i said that's funny i think it would be busier people are dying to get in well done see uh so my i, I gotta tell you my favorite dad joke of all time and i, I try and pick one a year that it, that just it just i don't know triggers the funny bone the have you heard the one about the norwegian navy putting barcodes on the sides of their warships 
So when they come back to port, they can Scandinavian. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. It's one of my favorites. That's ridiculous. Why haven't I not heard that one? Before? I know, <laughs> it, but I had not heard it in all my years of punning. And, and so now my TikTok channel is getting likes, my YouTube channel, my Facebook channel. And so people are messaging me all of these random dad jokes from all around the world. Send me the link to the TikTok channel. I'm going to visit a cousin on the weekend, and she just loves dad jokes. It is absolutely her favorite thing. Well, yeah, and so my so here's my top three. My other one is, and this one probably relates because uh, it works well with an Aussie accent. Here's my special Ed Fox dad jokes. There's my TikTok. For those of you watching this on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook, you can scan that with your phone, James, and you can save that. Um, but uh, what did the 80-year-old pirate say at his birthday party? I'm 80. I'm 80. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So that's <laughs> that that was my 2021 dad joke of the year. My Norwegian Navy is the 2022 dad joke of the year. And my other favorite one is, and I'm a Pokemon fan. So my wife and I, we used to run Pokemon trading card tournaments back in the day. And all of our our three kids grew up around uh, trading card games and stuff, Pokemon and Magic the Gathering. Anyway, uh, but we used to like going and doing Pokemon Go when it came out in 2016. That was date night. We'd go and drive around town and 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 throw a bunch of Pokeballs, stop by Sonic, get the Route 44, Diet Dr Pepper. Uh, Sonic, you want want to sponsor it? You can do that too. Um, and and so my two Pokemon jokes are my 2022. Uh, 20 I've lost count. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, how do you get Pikachu on a bus? You Pokemon. Isn't that bad? And then why don't you shower with a Pokemon? Because he'll Pikachu. Ah. So, so yeah, so those go over really well with the kids. Although, uh, what do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. What's brown and sticky? That one. What's brown and sticky? A stick. Those work well with the younger kids too. So anyway, there is that. So um, there's not words much are fun. Say. Words <laughs> are fun. And I've got a sales coach in my networking group and he's taken, I've taken on one of his phrases and his phrase is words matter. So what we say, what we say has impact and we have to be, we maybe have to choose our words more carefully occasionally. All speech is action. This is a thing that, that one learns. Uh, I, I have a master's in linguistics, along with before that, uh, three degrees, including a doctorate in theater. But um, one of the things that you pretty much have to learn if you're studying linguistics is all speech is action. And everybody's like, oh, I'm just saying, no, 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 no. You are doing a thing in my direction with the expectation of producing an effect on me and probably hoping that I will respond in some way, even if I don't undertake an action. I will have some kind of response. And people sometimes talk about um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's fine. But if somebody is standing there saying, hey, throw sticks and stones at that guy, <laughs> you know, it's some speech is literally operating instruction. So we do have to consider, you know, the whole the whole yelling movie in a crowded firehouse. Oh, no, with the other that was an old Steve Martin joke. <laughs> Yes, and I appreciate that too. If you uh, uh, if you follow some of those guys and and the way they utilize words, I was always a a Victor Borger fan. Bor oh Borger. yeah, Borger. and where he does inflationary language, where he does his bit. I don't know if you've heard about it, but he does. I, I have, I think, but refreshing. Okay. So so he says, what if? And we're in an inflationary period of time. So if you haven't heard this, uh, folks, go onto YouTube and find it. Search uh, in inflationary language. Um, I don't know the spelling, but Victor, Victor Borger, B-O-R-G-A maybe. And um, he talks about, well, think about all the terms we use that are numbers. What if they, what if they got inflated because of inflation? So 10 becomes 11, four becomes five. So what if you were eating a pork 11 de loin with a five, you know, <laughs> instead of a pork tenderloin with a fork? So, so just this whole bit was something I found as a kid on an old DVD, or it wasn't a DVD, it was VHS and beta back when I was a kid. Um, and it was this whole Victor Borges set up about this inflationary language. And I'm like, 
oh, I'm in love. The other one is one that my nan taught me was one, one was a racehorse. Two, two was one, two, one, 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 one race one day and two, two, one, one, two. So, you know, I've been educated on this stuff as a kid to fall in love with words. And I find that your writing just wants me to keep reading. It, it, it just forces me to keep reading whether I want to or not, because I'm enjoying. And, and when words get put in, putting putting down when words get put down. down when words get put down on paper or on a website and and you can keep people engaged i think that's that's important did um did you happen to come across anything about my book songs on love and grammar i have not tell me about it, it it's a bunch it was one of the first things i did even before i started my blog which was um a bunch of fun light verse about um accidents of grammar let me yeah let read me, one for us read yeah one. let me find some of them only work well with with um uh seeing it in print but right. there's one here uh indecent prepositions it's uh five stanzas just so you know you don't have okay. to run out I met a buxom grammatician and said I'd like her out to take back she came with proposition in let's stay and out let's make I proceeded with elation, her proposal up to take, and so prepared my habitation, output cat, up bed did make. In she came, and around stalking, swiftly over she did take, and declared with eyebrow cocking that me over she would make. Up she tied me then and there, and smoothly off my clothes did take, and while I lay with syntax bare, she with my wallet off did make. <laughs> the upshot of my disquisition, it is how down not to be shaken, except indecent preposition, and you might well in be taken. <laughs> so the whole point is... Just uh, you know, having fun with ideas about about grammar and and usage and so forth, um, and yeah, that some of some of them are not here than others. <laughs> right. Well, and and the, the the fact is that these play on words. One of my business lines that I like, I heard from stage one time, and there's not a lot of play on words, but just the way that it's put together to me is really good. I despise the guys that criticize and minimize the enterprise of all the guys whose enterprise makes them arise above the guys that criticize. I, that has a lot of power. Get off your butt and go to work before you're going to criticize somebody else that's actually doing something, right? And so I, I, there's a lot of those fun ones out there, and I'm sure more will come back. I love tongue twisters. Um, oh. There's a great author, uh, Banjo Patterson, who writes some great stuff. Australian bush balladist um, did the did the Man from Snowy River poem that they made a movie out of that became popular. But just the the uh, the spirit of the Australian outback that he invokes with the way that he describes describes looking at the sunburnt country and you know although that's from a Dorothy McKellar poem but um just the way he describes the outback you can you feel like you're there clancy of the overflow i wrote to him what looked like from a letter dipped uh, fingernail dipped in tar i mean just describes the way the guy had written and i'm like i can i i, I don't think i'll ever be able to write something that cool you know i'm i'm not so familiar with him he sounds but he sounds sort of like the australian uh, equivalent to Robert Service. Uh, have you heard of Robert Service? No, I have not. The Canadian poet who, uh, well, he wrote poetry about the Klondike gold rush. So he's okay. best known for the shooting of Dan McGrew and the cremation of Sam McGee, um, both of which are much too long to uh, read out here. Um, but they they have a certain wicked wit to them. Right. Um, so those who, who wish to uh, look them up look him up could I, a lot of people will um will have heard you know the the uh, cremation of sam mcgee starts there are strange things done neath the midnight sun by the men who moil the, for gold the arctic tales have their the arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold the northern lights have seen queer sights but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of lake labarge i cremated sam mcgee and that's how it starts and it's that's it's quite a long right. and very mischievous Right, a poem, and in fact, Sam McGee, the Sam McGee in question, is from Plum Tree down in Tennessee. So, oh, really? I think okay. I think your uh, your listeners and viewers would back together. 
There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So the Edward show, it does go global. We have three listeners, my mom, my aunt, and my sister. So we're and they're spread out. So it, it has global reach. So, um, you know, I do this because I, I, I meet interesting people and I, I want to have them on the show and I want to talk to them about what their passion is and what drives them. So how did you turn that love for words into a living? Well, I guess it started when I finished my uh, doctorate in theater and realized that I was not likely to become a professor of theater for a few reasons, uh, one of which the field is very crowded, another of which is that the people that they needed to hire were not specifically people with my particular background, and the third of which was I was really tired of academia. Right. So, um, so I moved to a different city just to sort of, you know, get a new fresh start, also because I'd been in Boston and I moved back to Canada. I didn't have to. I'm a dual citizen, but... Right. But I grew up in Canada, and there's a certain something to uh, the familiarity of it, in a way. Um, but And I started looking for work, doing things. And the thing is that I've always been good with words. And once I became aware of uh, editing as a career, that it was something that I sort of gradually sidled into. I took some courses. I uh, started working on things. I also discovered that a lot of my graduate school education had actually been a surreptitious training for editing, understanding how to structure things and put things together. But the big thing is, um, I really enjoy language. I enjoy uh, helping it be, helping expression be as much as it possibly can. There are a lot of people out there whose approach to language is sort of like they're approach to children they don't like. They feel it's unruly and they just want to impose some order. And I do not believe in that approach. Um, there, there are lots of people out there selling books uh, that can be very popular that are mostly like, oh, these awful people who are destroying the language. Here is how to smite them. And I just, I do not see it that way. Do you see um, language as a growing living thing? It absolutely is. And I mean, the funny thing is even dead languages are living. Latin, which has not had native speakers for a very long time, nonetheless has progressed in many ways. It, it went through a medieval periods. The pronunciations have shifted. The way people use it has shifted. Frankly, there are some people now who are writing choral music um, and similar things in Latin because they like the sound of it. Unfortunately, I don't think very much of their handling of the Latin because it's it's very clunky and not very, it, it seems like a word for word calc from English when Latin, it's like, it's like driving a Lamborghini like a pickup truck. Why would you do that? Right. Um, but well, I, I don't want to so, geek out too much. Right. But but I appreciate the take on that. My trouble has always been as a, as a high school dropout, I finished ninth grade and started my first business. Um, and I did well in English, but my sentences tend to be one long sentence, right? It's like, punctuation's not my favorite. And then when it comes to sales and business, that's a whole different rule of how you write for sales and business. Mm -hmm. So I now fall into, I have a love for cricket. Uh, it's a passion for me, the sport of cricket, bat and ball sport, British baseball, for those of you not familiar with it. Built my own cricket field in Kansas back in the, the early 2000s. And so cricket for me is always capitalized. And so you built your own field of cricket dreams. Did boycott did. show up? Uh, no, thank goodness, because I bat as slow as Boycott. For those of you that don't know, Jeffrey Boycott uh, is pretty good at what he does, uh, but he bats a lot slower than the average player. Now I'm looking for my virtual background that is my cricket field. There it is. Ah. So that's the cricket field I built. Uh, for those of you that want to see it, you can get onto YouTube, uh, probably Facebook and LinkedIn anyway, but that's there. But so I always capitalize cricket. And so somebody pointed that out in when they wrote a uh, introduction of me, Edward Fox, the guy that always thinks cricket should start with a capital letter, even if it's in the middle of a sentence. Yes, that is me. So cricket is always emphasized. So I, I love the sport of cricket. And uh, so I do that. But I have in sales, I tend to find that I run by a rule that says if it's three letters or less, it's not capitalized. Everything else is capitalized in the headline. <laughs> right. So so words matter. A lot. 
would all be capital. The first letter would all be capitalized, right? Words used at the uh, in networking, so in wouldn't be capitalized. Uh, used might not be capitalized because it's not the focus, but everything else. And so I get in trouble all the time. My daughter, uh, she's like, you can't. I said, sales rules, sales rules are different than grammar rules, right? So anyway, that's just my take on well, it. Well, the fact is, when you're selling, it is fundamentally a capitalist thing, right? There you go. I'm, I'm going to steal that. That is great. I, I'll tell you, um, I mean, a couple things about that. First of all, um, one of the ways I make my living is by having people who write the way they feel and know the things they know and just want it to be tied it up and put it in a shape that's going to have a better effect on a certain set of readers. So, right. I mean, yep. literally, why would I complain about people writing weirdly? That's how I make my money. Right. Why would I complain about that? <laughs> um, but, exactly. but secondly, I, um, I do tend to take a Machiavellian uh, approach to these things. Effects matter the most. I one time realized going to restaurants here and there, the only restaurant menus that have no errors in them are the big corporate chains that right. can afford proofreaders. Right. All small restaurants have errors in their menus. Why? Because they're written by the chefs. Chefs don't train in spelling. In fact, it's just I I think it's almost a badge of pride, frankly, for for them to make the occasional error and what to do. All that tells me is I'm at a place where the chef made the menu. Right. Which means it could be a lot more interesting. So exactly, yeah. It's it's some pe people get very upset about saying errors, and I'm thinking, why? Why do you get upset? And I, I mean, I know the answer. I've written about the answer. It's basically, socially licensed aggression. They feel that they're offended, but actually, what it is is it's dominance behavior. But I, uh, the I've written Nazis, articles right? about like, that. I, I like reading grammar Nazis, and and I, I like that Facebook post that's uh, your, your, and your. You know. Uh, and used incorrectly some of you will be triggered by this you know and, and then it just goes into that and, you know it, i'm writing a book right now it's called be authentic unless you're a serial killer don't be that change because you know what i looked at other titles i looked at like be authentic unless you're a jerk then don't be that change doesn't have the same impact right um be authentic unless you're an asshole again has different impact and might be powerful, but doesn't have the same impact as be authentic unless you're a serial killer, then don't be that change. Because we can all be jerks. We can all be assholes. Uh, we all have that time that we're not, but we know whether or not we're serial killers, right? We yeah. know that. Nobody else might know that, but we know whether or not we're serial killers. And as somebody said to me the other day, they said, aren't you afraid that like a real serial killer will get offended and be you'll be put on their... I said, well, up until now, I was not. <laughs> I Somehow it just seems like inventing things to worry about. Yeah, I, I, I tell my kids 90% of, I don't know where this came from, 90% of what you worry about never happens and the other 10% we can't do anything about. You know, and if I'm proven wrong, it really tends to fit into one of those categories in most cases. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about certain things but life is too short to be if you're writing a facebook post and you're picking on somebody because they wrote you are or your or ain't or words that we use in everyday speech that we might not know how to correctly spell but we get the point we get the point of the right. post why pick on them and that that also it's one of my favorite points people will say well you you if you use bad english it's it's a problem with clarity. I'm like clarity, schmarity, guy. You you're screaming a correction at the person. That means you understood what they were saying. The truth is, you can't understand a person. You don't scream a correction at them. You say what? It's yes. not clarity. The clarity is not the point. It's like it's like the people who get really upset if somebody's wearing socks with sandals, you know, or white after Labor Day, or uh, anything like that. Suspenders and a belt. I just like to be safe. I wear suspenders and a belt, you know, get get crap on that too. So um, do you have words? So one of the things that frustrates me is, like I said, high school dropout, but well-read. So words that 
come across that people misunderstand. Um, like an, one for me that my Indian dot not feather friends use all the time is intimate. I would like to intimate to you, share information with, right? Basically, yeah. intimate to you that uh, the game isn't going to start at 10.30 because we're on Indian stretchable time. It's going to start at 11. You know, I'm always there at 9.30 for the game to start at 10.30, but their games don't start till 11, even though they say 10.30. And the first time I heard the word intimate, I'm like, uh, dude, like, I, I don't swing that way. I, you know, I don't want you to be intimate with me. No, he said, no, intimate. I had to look it up. I had to Google intimate. I, did, I should have found you back then, but I didn't. I found. Yeah. Well, he's letting you in on the secret. It seems like, a, it seems like, um, a fancier word than is required, but well, yeah, it, it, it may be, be it may be more commonly used in the variety of English he speaks. In, in India, certainly, um, they do use words differently than say in England or the U.S. I remember seeing a picture of a thing that said Hindu military hotel, and what that was was actually a restaurant that served meat but had Hindu chefs, because military meant that it included meat, and hotel meant it was a restaurant. Oh, wow. I see. Yeah, exactly. And I found that even coming to the US, being raised on Australian English, as opposed to American English, as opposed to British English, all of those Englishes have a different flavor, just like Spanish, just like any other, just like uh, variations of French. We find different words are used differently. Mm -hmm. I got up in front of my networking group and I said, I'm looking for an introduction to somebody that owns a car yard and I get this glazed look everybody's like what I'm like and I've been here so long that now I don't know whether I'm using American words incorrectly or I'm using Australian words that they don't understand but they didn't put together car and yard and they said you mean dealership what's a car yard I said well you know where they have lots of cars they said no that's a dealership I said no no used cars Oh, that's a car lot. I said, oh, well, that makes sense because there's a lot of cars. <laughs> no, that's not why it's called a car lot. I said, well, hang on. We're in Kansas. They have a cattle yards where they keep the cattle and the buyers go buy the cattle from the cattle yard. Why wouldn't I go to a car yard to buy a car? And they said, no, that's Oklahoma. A yard full of cars is where they're up on blocks and the grass is growing up. <laughs> so, so just words like that, right? Um, Fanny is a word that Americans use Ooh. that Australians don't use, right? So you, I'm sure yeah. you've run across words like that. Oh, I um actually have a um poem in here that I think uh, covers that quite well. Prelude to an unexpected weekend at the estate. <clears throat> to an estate I've been invited. The lady has me quite excited. To England I've not been before, but listen up to what's in store. She asked. Do say, may I depend on you to come at the weekend? And in her eyes, I saw a gleam. We'll have some syrup and ice cream. I hope that you and I may sup. Just pop on by and knock me up. I told her I would do my best. Ah, hospitality, I'm impressed. So, you know, weekend, weekend in England is weekend here. Ice cream, as opposed to ice cream, and knock me up, meaning stop by and knock on my door, right. as opposed to what it means in North America. Yes, exactly. I was there. I was in England in 85 for the first time. And I, I was, uh, it wasn't Airbnb, but it was a friend of a friend's house. I was there with my dad and my grandfather. And the young lady that showed me up to my room said, I'll knock you up in the morning. <laughs> or do you want me to knock you up in the morning? I'm thinking that's not the way I think that goes. But well, what do you mean by that? What well, do you want me to knock on the door and wake you up? Oh, oh, okay, great. So I had this similar thing when my wife, who's a Kansas American girl, and I, uh, we met when she went to Australia on vacation. She goes back home. I come over for a month. We get engaged. I go back home and we start planning the wedding via phone, 1989. And she said, I said, well, we don't have a lot of money. What sort of, are we going to put on a spread for dinner or what? Are we, what are we? No, let's just do um, mints and nuts. And I said, mince, you mean like steak tartare? So for me, minced meat, right? Hamburger for an American, minced meat for me. She, I heard her say M-I-N-C-E, mince. So I right. thought it was minced meat. And so we're going back and forth. And she's like, why aren't you understanding what I'm saying? 
well, why aren't you saying what I'm understanding, right? So I, so we're going to have mints like steak tartar. No, that's gross. I said, okay, well, anyway, I got to run. I got to go to work. So I go to work all that day and I'm thinking about, well, what mints and nuts, like almonds put inside of this hamburger meat. Like it sounds Mediterranean. I'm okay with that. I get back on the phone the next day and I'm like, did you mean fruit mints? She goes, yes. So now I'm thinking Fig Newtons. I'm thinking minced fruit tarts, right? Where they've minced up the fruit. So we call it fruit mints, right? Or mints, depending on the topic. Three months goes by. I thought I've got it sorted. I go to the reception after the wedding and I walk in and here's this big bowl of nuts, a bowl of punch and a bowl of candy. Mints, M-I-N-T-S. Yes. This is actually relates directly to a story from my childhood when uh, when my parents uh, at the time tended to, if we were having people over, they would have bowls of mints uh, around. But my mother had baked a couple of pies and she says, do you want apple or mints? And I'm like, mints? And we just tear over and eat all the mints out of the bowl. But then she gave us mincemeat pie, and my brother made up this long, ridiculous story about how mincemeat came from minces, which were animals that lived in caves in Mexico. I believed a lot of really false... One of the great ways to learn a lot of really false things is to have an older brother. Right. Yep. Yeah, he yep. would. He just made things up. Yeah, there's a, there's it a took dad me years joke. to realize some of them weren't true. There's a dad joke about, I'm so glad for my older brother, he told me... I had a disease that was going to kill me if I didn't eat a handful of dirt each day or something like that is, you know, is that's what older brothers do. You know, um, I had four younger sisters and I used to like to say, Hey, when you're good, you're good. And when you're terrific, you're me. And they would all groan. And, you know, so you would, you would perpetuate this information. You know, I never told my sisters they were adopted. They looked too much like me. That would cast aspersions on myself as well. Do you have words like I, one of my sons, his favorite word as a four-year-old was menagerie. As a four-year-old. I'm like, oh, I've got a genius on my hands. No, we're watching an episode of Super Friends and the evil queen turns all the Super Friends, Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, turns them in all into stone and puts them in her rock menagerie. So he right. had shown me a group of rocks and he said, dad, look at my rock menagerie. And I might be off by a year, might have been five. But you know, so his his word we would use menagerie all the time, and then my um, my middle child he likes uh, a plethora, a plethora. <laughs> Dad, you've got a plethora of choices on where you can take me for our special day together. I know I have a plethora of choices. Why don't we go get some food? He says, "Ooh." He said, "What would we call that?" I said, "Well, you could say a plethora of food, but how about a cornucopia of food?" That's like the big horn with all the the yeah. fruit, the food of come. Oh, he says, oh, that's a good word. And so him and I, do you have some favorites? Um, boy, one of the one of the easiest ways to get me to just completely freeze up is to ask me about favorite. I'm not a person who's who picks a lot of favorites, but if I'm gonna say, like, well, do you have a word my, you enjoy the... saying? Do you is sure. something roll off the tongue? Floxy now see nihil pelification. And which is the action of estimating something as worthless. Okay. A word that you can use on itself, because how much use can you get out of a word that means the action of estimating something as worthless? Right. That's a word that was just made up, um, basically, by somebody putting together a dictionary. Okay, well, I have a word for you that my grandfather always used to tell me was the anti-disestablishmentarianism. Is that oh, a real yes. word? Anti-disestablishmentarianism. Uh, I don't even know what it means. I think if I broke it down, oh. I could figure it out. But. Yeah. Yeah, you, it 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 means you're against disestablishmentarianism, and disestablishmentarianism is disestablishing specifically the Church of England. So ah. it was people who said, no, 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 don't make the Church of England uh, no longer a, an established church of the government. That's where it really comes from. And most people who know the word have no idea, and it's not really useful today, but neither is pneumono-ultramicroscopic pneumono silica volcanoconiosis. Right. Which, of course, that leads us to supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I don't know. Is that an actual, I don't know. Is that well, it is now. I mean, okay. they defined it. They made up the only, my big problem with this, and my dad pointed this out to me, is that right in the middle, so you got supercalifragilisticexpi, and yet you spell it I-C-E-X, 
under normal circumstances, you would say supercalifragilisticexpi. Why is that? Also, ick is always a terminal morpheme, which means it's a, it's a suffix. If you don't stick another whole half of the word onto it normally. So it's a weird word, but it's established as a word. It's just like um, now we used to be able to say and write miking, as in, you know, putting a microphone on and we might write it with a K. But that has shifted now when everybody writes mic with a C, except for like old farts like us. Um, and so how the heck do you write miking? And they're like, M-I-C hyphen I-N-G. I'm like, you could just use a K there, guys. But eh, language changes. What can I say? I uh, Some of the words that people use, and sometimes it's just accent. And I'm a bad one to talk about it because Australians turn uh, with their accent. They say uh, instead of cartoon, it's cartoon. 13 becomes 13. You know, uh, tattoo is a double D instead of a double T. So uh, I see, I hear things like axing, right? Uh, I'm just axing. Well, oh, yeah. no, you're not, right? But but the ones that get me more is things like irregardless. No, you just mean regardless. It's yeah. not irregardless. Well, we use inflammable. We use... Uh, well, true. Children is a double plural. Childer was the original plural, and then they added on an N because they thought, well, no, it doesn't sound plural enough. Children is literally childses. <laughs> and axing, amusingly... The word ask was originally ax, and then we shifted it to ask um, a long time ago. And so you could say it's just going backwards. I mean, it's, why and do people machine. hate irregardless? Because it sounds dumb. And so they it licenses a person to treat like the other person like they're dumb. Right. It's sort of like the time when I was in um, university, and it was a cool, breezy day, and I put on earmuffs because I'm prone to earaches. But it wasn't all that cold, and I come in... And one of my uh, fellow students in the university residence like, you're really cold today. Ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, what's it got to do with you? How is my wearing earmuffs any offense to you? But it's the same thing. It's like, well, you look dumb to me, so I'm going to right. respond accordingly. Well, and I grew up uh, watching all these shows from different countries, you know, because we had a big British influence. We had a big um, big American influence, but then we had a, a, a huge influx of Vietnamese and Indians in the seventies, uh, Indian again, dot not feather, but um, from South Asia, <laughs> sorry, can't help myself. Um, I, I, I know a lot of people who would, who would that, definitely peel a strip off of me for using that term of phrase. Right, of phrase. right, right, exactly. And they do to me too. I said, look, when I tell you dot not feather, I have a lot of Indians. I love Indians. But when I talk to some American teachers, they still don't realize that they called Native Americans Indians because Columbus thought he was finding India. Yeah. Right. And they don't they don't know that. How do you become a teacher? Now, you might be a PE teacher. I understand. But how do you become a teacher without knowing that the term Indians was used about by Columbus and and perpetuated because he thought he was finding yeah. the continent uh, finding the country of india so so for me yeah, dot, not, they would know that you would think but they they also i i was standing there i was teaching a, a group of eighth graders about cricket and i said um cricket is played mostly by british commonwealth countries and in fact the number one group of people that play cricket the most are indians and they love the sport of cricket. There's about a billion and a half of them. And they play cricket and they treat it like a religion. And the teacher takes me aside and she says, you know, if you're going to come in here and you're going to teach my kids about things, can you get your facts straight? I said, uh, okay, sure. Uh, educate me. She goes, uh, Indians don't play cricket. They play lacrosse. It was a, a game on the East Coast of you know. Oh, lacrosse is one of the national sports in Canada. Nobody right. plays with it. Everybody knows what it is. Right, right, exactly. So so she, she didn't I, know she that didn't... Indian also refers to India. Right. And Yikes. so the easiest example is dot not feather because it it they instantly understand it. They may not like it and it may not be politically correct, but there is no offense there. There is it's it's a simple descriptive term that gets you to understand. Not all Indians wear a bindi either, right? You know, you have so, Christian Indians. So anyway. So growing up in Alberta back when yep. um, when they were still usually called Indians in Canada as opposed to First Nations, we would always have to say, you know, Indians from India. 
um, because, or East Indian was the other term. Right. Um, and then of course there's West Indian, which is from the West Indies. Now it's a lot more resolved in Canada just because the term Indian is not so much used for, for American Indians, First Nations, right. Aboriginal peoples, whichever term you want to use. Right. And also in Canada, there's a lot of people here whose families came originally from India. So um, I live in Toronto, and let me tell you, uh, this is a city with people from absolutely everywhere. So if you say Indian in Toronto, people will assume you mean from India. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I understand that it's a very different thing in a place like Oklahoma, say. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Kansas, Missouri, yeah. Texas, Tennessee. Um, and, and cricket flies below the radar. It, cricket is the second biggest sport in the world behind soccer and the u.s is the third largest pay-per-view cricket market according to oh. direct tv back in the day is where i got that stat from and so it's india england and the u.s because the u.s has 15 million people that follow the sport of cricket from all the british commonwealth countries so uh so it, it's very to me it's interesting just like the pokemon effect as i call it parents a lot of parents don't know pokemon but their kids loved explaining it to them about and enjoyed playing it because their parents didn't know well cricket sort of flies below the radar and i talked to a lot of my indian friends that like to have cricket as their thing and they don't want americans to ever play cricket i want america to play cricket to professionalize the sport i think americans do sports well and that the old idea of the British Commonwealth of clubs and and Eton and Harrow and Cambridge and Oxford and and sport building the leaders that we send out to die on the battlefields of the world um, yeah. has changed. And I think sport is great entertainment and I think Americans do it well. So I want Americans to get into cricket. I want the Chinese to get into cricket. I want it to be the biggest sport in the world. You know, um. Cricket's reasonably popular in some areas around here, too. I remember being at York University on the north side of Toronto, and they have a big lawn right in the middle of the campus, and there were a bunch of kids who would set up garbage cans at each end of the lawn and were using them for their wickets. And I'm thinking, I wonder how that works exactly. I mean, you just have to say, well, that seemed like it knocked one off. I don't know. <laughs> right. If it, Yeah, so we used the big wheelie bins as kids to play cricket, Oh. And if it hit the wheelie bin, you could hear it with a tennis ball. So, but Canada almost became a test playing nation, which is the pinnacle yeah. according to the uh, international body. I think every country is a test playing nation. Test is just a term, right? When we play a, a longer format of the game, that's a test. It's an emotional, physical, mental endurance test. Uh, and I think all countries should play it. But uh, Canada... It was between uh, Canada and 1979, Canada and New Zealand, I think it was, on who became a test playing nation. Canada was that good at the time and mm -hmm. played in the 79 World Cup. And uh, New Zealand won out. And then uh, a bunch of Asian countries were the next test countries like Bangladesh and, and right. um, Sri Lanka came in. Usually and, popular around yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because it really feels like with the uh, subcontinental, some subcontinental demeanor and persona, cricket is a superb fit. Crick, you know, chess came from India, right? Is my understanding. Yeah. Um, and so, so. Really, cricket is a giant chess game. You've got a huge board that you've got to try and cover with nine fielders. It's not like baseball where we get to move a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, depending on a right field hitter or a left field hitter. And baseball has its own intricacies that are really cool. But for me, tying it into what you do, the words that we take from cricket that Americans know and use, I've been stumped. Ah, I forgot about that one. Okay. I'm stumped. Oh, I'm stumped. I don't know what to do. That's a cricket term. Uh, sticky wicket. Oh, right. I'm caught on a sticky wicket. They have no idea what a sticky wicket is. In fact, most cricketers don't know what a sticky wicket is because it was before the pitches were covered when they were just dirt or grass. I was surprised to learn that too. I always assumed it was a wicket where the bales just wouldn't come off. And then I'm like, what? It's because of the mud? Oh, 
Right, because the the ball you would you and I would play, and uh, I would you would bat first, and you'd score four hundred runs because the pitch is perfect. And then it rains overnight, and I come out, and I'm all out for fifty runs. You know, I'm only three hundred. Oh, I got caught on a sticky wicket because it rained overnight, dried just enough that we could play on it. But the ball, when you would pitch it, would stick and spin and turn and not have a consistent bounce. So you get caught on a sticky wicket. So words from cricket work in the american language and they use it you know they use it occasionally they'll do stumped more often than sticky wicket but they like to bring up the term oh that's a bit of a sticky wicket like do you even know what that means Eh, we use terms all the time that we don't remember where they're from and then people will make up the weirdest weirdest stories often having to do with with nautical stuff there's one thing that's going around about uh, life in the 14th century or whatever, supposedly raining cats and dogs being from your cats and dogs falling out. And it's absolute made up rubbish. And I'm pretty sure that the person who originally uh, wrote it was doing it to take the piss as the right. saying yep. goes. But a lot of people take it seriously. And then you, the um, there's a famous uh, uh, expression, cold enough to freeze the balls off a brass monkey. Right. And People are like, well, that was because there was a brass trivet on sailing ships that was called a monkey, and you stack the cannonballs on it. I'm like, okay, there's, yeah, and then you know what? They would sh- it would shrink. There are so many things wrong with that. First of all, it's very easy to go and find that before that that expression came along, there were a lot of other expressions such as hot enough to melt the nose off a brass monkey that just referred to extremes of temperature using a brass monkey arbitrarily as a clear image like cereal. A stone, a stone. If it's wet, you know it's raining. Yeah, if yeah. it's dry, you know, there's a drought, you know, whatever. It's that. So the other thing, you know, obviously nobody's going to be piling cannonballs in a pyramid on the deck of a ship. Guys, ships go like this. And the differential rate of shrinkage, and I decided just to, <laughs> let's just see the differential rate of shrinkage between brass and iron. the iron or lead in a cannonball. Minimal, minimal, minimal. So But people just love these stories. And the funny thing is that sometimes the real story is even more fun than than the one that they've made up. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm sorry to say, but there are a lot. Look at my look at my website. Right. I was always interested in threshold. Threshold to me was always an interesting word. Uh, and and Google, you know, Google makes it easy. World Book Encyclopedia back in the day, it just didn't get into the depth on the word etymology. Oh. My favorite dad joke, you've probably heard this one before. Uh, Another favorite is, what's the difference between an entomologist and an etymologist? The etymologist knows the difference. (laughs) You know, so for those of you that don't know, an entomologist is about bugs, an etymologist is about words, and and so an etymologist would know what an entomologist was. So anyway, but that reminds me of that. So threshold, to me, was fun to hear the fact that the threshold held back the straw, the thresh, whatever it was. That's the story I've heard. Is it true? Do you know? Well, I'm just looking at the uh, my blog entry on threshold from 13 years ago. Oh, to refresh my memory. Okay, so you're looking at you're looking at threshold from a post you did years ago. Look at that. I should have found that. So yes, the uh, the hold, I believe is actually a reanalysis. It came from, um, in Old English, it was scold or or sold. Um, and it seems to be related to Swedish triskel and Danish telskel. Um, and so the, the thresh there referred first to trampling with the feet as opposed to using flails or things like that to thresh, thresh grain. So it's basically a, a, just a place that gets trampled. Okay. Um, so not necessarily to hold anything. No, the hold back. the hold is just completely uh completely accidental. Um it's just like um outrage is one of my favorite. People okay. are like, oh outrage raged out at it. it has nothing to do with rage. It's from French outrage, which is the age as the same as in, for instance, garage. Garage is a place where you store things, gare, uh, or you know, keep them. And outrage is so, an instance of something being outré. Well, you know what outré is. You know, it's 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 not done. It's it's away. It's out of. It's beyond. 
So it it's an outer edge in a way. Right. So it has nothing to do with put it rage, away but from now you, it does don't because do it. we look right. at it and we think rage. So guess what? Now it's now we think raging. That's the way it is because words can pick up detritus. A rolling stone gathers no moss, but a rolling word gathers tons of it. That is so true. And I'm, you know, I it, one of the challenges I had, my biggest fear of of having you come on the show was showing up my ignorance. And then I thought, well, hang on, most of my listeners know I'm an ignorant idiot anyway. So I'll just be playing up to the crowd. So because there's things that we all specialize in, there's things that we have advantages. And and folks, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid for your ignorance to be shown. Understand we're all ignorant in some areas. If I had James explain cricket, he could do more than some Americans could do. But then I've got some Americans that could explain cricket better than I can. So it, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. One of my favorite things to say is, I don't know, because that then means that I can go find out. L a hilarious thing that happens to me from time to time is seeing a word I'll swear high and low I've never seen before, and then I'll go and realize that I blogged about it four years ago. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> There's a ton of words that I've forgotten that just talking to you and then reading your article on the butterfly, I think it's like a 52-piece email. It's we're on nine or 10. It's, it's only going to get up to 12. I'm, I'm just in the Americas right now. And there are challenges just because the languages that are heavily spoken in the Americas are ones I already covered from Europe and all the ones that are less spoken, it's harder to get information. But I, I right. the main thing is I've got lots of words, but I just don't know any etymological background on them. I've got the entomology, but not the right. etymology. Right, right. There you go. I, that's, I was hoping you would tie those together. So I appreciate that. But uh, the, the words that when I'm reading your stuff and it, it just keeps coming, oh, this word. Oh, I love that word. Oh, yeah, this word. And then, of course, we get on this show and I can't think of half of those words. It's like, oh, man, like I should have written the list. Be more prepared. Do your research. But so if people... With you doing your editing and stuff, do you have a particular type of client that uh, you are looking for or, or you would like a referral to? I mostly work with publishing companies rather than individual clients. Right. Um, it's not that I never work with individual clients. It's just that people who are individual authors, um, A, tend to be a lot less familiar with the process. So there's an education aspect. B, often have budgetary expectations that aren't fully in line with reality right um yeah i want you to edit so, my book for 200 bucks please yeah okay it's yeah, i mean you know there's there's that and see some of them are coming around with books that are simultaneously five hundred thousand words and only one thousand good words um <laughs> But, you know, they'll write a lot and most of it's not very good. And I'm right. And they don't want to hear it. And also, if I were to turn it into a good book for them, it would cost them a lot of money. So right. it just it's it, it, you're in sales. So, you know what it's like to have a pre-qualified buyer. Right. right. Yes. Well, when I work with publishing companies, I'm working with authors who already come in pre-qualified um, and they there's more understanding of how the process works. Um, and, you know, a, a publishing company, individual authors, I work with some of them and I'll send them an invoice and they will pay me five minutes later. Right. Others will just never get around to it, mind <laughs> you. Publishing yeah. companies can be relied on to pay within about a month. Right. You know, um, and it, it works fine. And frankly, my calendar is so very full. I have to aggressively protect my vacation time right well which I, I do well, i do not i i absolutely i block it out of my schedule i absolutely refuse to let work take over my vacations for the simple reason vacations are what i'm working for i'm working right. to earn the money to enjoy it why on earth would i so i can't enjoy i'm busy work, earning the money yeah i want to earn money i love earning money but i also love spending it Exactly. That's why we make it. So we didn't get to talk about your photography. That's another thing I would like to talk about. I appreciate that you have a full schedule. Um, if at some point your schedule opens up and you'd like to come back and talk about your photography and can people buy any of your work? Is that available to purchase? Sure. Well, um, so I have 
three books available online. I actually have five books. The other two are uh, cookbooks, just because I also like to cook. Okay. Um, all on Lulu.com. Um, Songs of Love and Grammar, 12 Gifts for Writers, which is a very thin book of advice for people who, who just want to sort of get the hang of them, find their voice and so forth in writing. It works to undo a lot of the dumb crap they'll read from elsewhere. Um, Confessions of a Word Lodge, which is really made of stuff from my blog. And I also have a book I didn't think called Paint, which is photographs of graffiti from around Toronto. Oh, wow. Cool. But again, you can see all those pictures on my Flickr. Right. Flickr.com slash sesquiotic. So, I mean, you can just see it for free. Awesome. Well, that's great. Hey, James, uh, I'd love to have you back on. I've got to move on to my next guest. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. And um, please reach out as your schedule opens up. Maybe we can keep a email dialogue and, yeah. and have you back. Yeah, great chatting with you. If you send me an email, we can just start talking about schedule for the new year. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.